I am Unicorn. I'm Haley. <laughs> no, you're not. You're a kitty cat. <laughs> and this is Night Classy, the podcast where tipsy teachers teach fascinating lessons. Happy Halloween, y'all. We are drinking a bag of wine because we're going back to college with our basic bitch costumes. <laughs> you, uh, we, since we're on YouTube now, which by the way, sorry that the last YouTube video wasn't out on episode release day. Um, we're working on that, but we need to like slap the bag and chuck it at the end of the episode. Like I don't know college. if there's going to be wine left by the end of the episode. I think there will be because I got to <laughs> drive, so I'm not having any. So That's unless true. you're going to drink all of that. plus I'll drink enough cup. for the both of us. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We could do that. We but I don't, I don't know if I really want a video of me slapping the bag That's on true. YouTube. And in college, when we slapped the bag, it was like r- Franzia oh. Rosé. Like it was basically uh, like juice. This yeah. is not juice. I don't know if I want to chug a, like grown up dark wine. Merlot or Malbec <laughs> or whatever the fuck it is out Malbec. of the bag. The Malbec just makes me think of sports for some reason. What? I don't know. <laughs> Malbec? Yeah, I don't know. Why? It does it not wa- I don't know why it doesn't make you think of sports. I have no idea why that would make you think Maybe of sports. Maybe it's because I know nothing about sports. <laughs> that might be it. That might be it. So, but like nothing makes me think of sports. The word sports literally doesn't even make me think of sports. It makes me think of like sweating in a stadium. (laughs) Like if I if I had to imagine what watching or being a sports fan is like, (laughs) it just makes me think sweat. (laughs) The word sports to me reminds me of theater sports, which is like an improv theater in Seattle. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> They're going to say like acting exercises. And no. It's like, when I don't do improv, but I you... really enjoy watching it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't see you enjoying that. No, I'm just not um, animated enough. I have bad RBF and... I don't have any other facial expressions. It's hard to keep saying yes to things and to keep going. In My improv. soul says say no. Yeah. To everything. <laughs> Every so time. I can't say yes and. It's not in my nature. No and. No. <laughs> don't ask again. No and stop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <I'm out. laughs> That's it. Improv just doesn't work. So we started a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I can, I can talk. Rigorous notes. Yes. As long as there's a plan, there's a plan in the notes. Uh, when, that's like when we did our Patreon episode of uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I had I was really excited to play Dungeons and Dragons, but I had like really bad anxiety the night before. Not really bad anxiety. I had mild anxiety the night before because I was afraid that you guys would pressure me to do a voice for my character. <laughs> and I really like do not like doing voices or acting or anything like that. And I was really nervous that you guys would like yell at me and say I had to speak in a British accent or something. In what world would any of us do that? Uh, In this world. I was really (laughs) surprised when it didn't happen. If anyone's going to do a voice, it's probably Alec. What? (laughs) 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 Alec did did do a voice. (laughs) What? He kind of did do a voice for his character. But it kind of stopped after like two times. He got lazy. Well, I was trying to run the whole show, and I could tell it was going to oh, go long. you were running the show. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> I meant news to me. Cause... I meant whenever we're doing video and audio, it becomes like too many things for my brain. And so playing D&D while doing all that, and then also like trying to make sure we were getting it in on time, it just was too yeah, much. I understand. That's fair. Yeah. Also, we are dressed up in Halloween costumes. That's what that weird intro was about. Uh, just BT dubs. Yeah, I forgot. We're both. I mean, <laughs> yours is a, a legit Halloween costume, but I'm literally just wearing pajamas. Oh, same. I think these are pajamas. I guess it would be kind of tough to sleep in this. I'm like wearing like a unicorn onesie and the head is a hood, but it's like a stuffed it's animal. It's a full on stuffed animal yeah. on top of your head. There's no way you could sleep in this. And we're, I, I swear, the biggest basic bitches in the world wearing a unicorn and a cat costume. Yeah. 
I I was gonna wear camouflage. Well, first of all, I forgot that this was the <laughs> Halloween episode, and then I was gonna wear a camouflage shirt and just be like, "I'm in the military." Ew. <laughs> and then I was not like, that "That's uh. you," but like, that's that's a dumb costume. Yeah, I would I would not <laughs> do that. <laughs> if just I'm gonna dress wear like a, a Republican for Halloween, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we gotta get the bush light and <laughs> throw out this wine. Yeah, I get the bush. Um, <laughs> I thought you were talking about a different bush. I'm like, do Republicans yeah. have bush? <laughs> oh, no. Bush no, is they don't. like notoriously <laughs> <laughs> liberal. <laughs> right? <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> the unshaven woman. <laughs> <laughs> Your memoir. <laughs> Well, well, <laughs> I don't know where to go. But yeah, I <laughs> see terrible at improv. <laughs> I was going to wear my skeleton morph suit. And then I thought about how uncomfortable it is. And I was just like, I can't sit in it. It's I like, can't. I can't. <laughs> I'm getting a Southern accent. I you swear. Are. Uh, but it is so weird. I, I told Haley in this story already. But when we were in Florida, we were playing a game with my family. And I was trying to say mean and I said Maine I don't <laughs> even know how that happened <laughs> because I'm getting a Memphis accent or you were getting really drunk <laughs> that too that too we were taking shots of limoncello because oh well not that you should ever take shots of limoncello but like um there was an underage person with us and <laughs> she it was like a joke that she drinks limoncello whatever but it's my stepsister <laughs> hi Hannah um, but yeah um yeah so did that um and i yeah i screwed up the game because no one knew what i was saying they thought i said maine well you're just a southern bell i am, I am southern, southern bell. bell valley girl <laughs> unicorn extraordinaire i took the two worst accents and i have mashed them up what do you think is the best accent British, like posh British? British, posh British, not like Cockney British. Like, uh, I disagree. What accent do you think is the best? I don't know. I like an Irish accent. I like an Australian accent. Hmm. I don't like either of those. Well, fuck you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you have a British accent. <laughs> wow. No. Well, really settling. <laughs> I don't I don't know what what's a good American accent. I feel like there isn't one. We no, all sound there terrible. Definitely is not a good American yeah, one. We all we, we all sound bad. Canadian's Maybe, okay. Uh, it's just like a little sprinkling of something different. I guess. Uh maybe like a good like a New York accent. Like that can be kind of fun. Yeah, I, I guess know. so. Anyway, <laughs> we're just pondering accents here. <gasps> We're being boring. Yeah, sorry, everyone. Nice dead air. <laughs> well, I don't yeah, know what sorry. accent do you think. Silence. I don't know what do you think. I don't Silence. Know. I'm not like big on accents. I could take them or leave them. Great to put it at the top of the show then. There's definitely uh, <laughs> accents that turn me off. Like a really thick Midwestern accent. Can't do it. Wow rude sorry it's true for a man i don't care about like i feel like women i don't know only but like, women can have midwestern accents i could not be turned on by a guy with like a thick midwestern <laughs> accent it wouldn't work there was some i for this is from someone i heard so i literally don't know where this came from and i've talked about this before but that the least amount of accent in the most neutral way of saying words is in like Southern Ohio. That's true. Southern Ohio and Kentucky. Boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. You are. This. You are perfect. You don't really have an accent. I mean, That's like good. everyone I mean, according has an to accent, you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> as far like I feel like it's a very mild like. Yeah, I, I feel like you could do voiceover work. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Is it's Maybe very I'll neutral try to get into some voiceover work. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I could not. Except people say. Uh, <laughs> I want to see cats like audition tape for doing voiceover. <laughs> hey. Hey. <laughs> so I was thinking. <laughs> no. This is my real. <laughs> funny to me when people think that we sound I alike. I know. That's like a, Helena, our new patron who we shouted out last week, she they yeah, she asked us um, what, like who was who? Because 
She didn't know who was who. Really? She can't tell her voices apart. And so then I did a poll on Instagram. Yeah. And I was like, can I you didn't tell our voices apart? And like 20% of people can't tell us apart. Okay. So it's not as many as I thought, but it just seems like we get that pretty often. Right. But like 200 people voted on this poll. So 20% is a lot of people. That is a lot of people. Yeah. Well, this is Haley, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't matter that you're Haley because no one can tell. That's true. I confuse. The only person I know for sure on like wine and crime is Amanda. That's true. I cannot tell Lucy and Lucy apart. <laughs> Kenny and I have they, no idea. In my mind, they're the same person. I can look at a picture of them and I don't know who's who. I don't and know I've who's been who. listening to that podcast like since the beginning. I don't even I don't know who does psych and who does the actual like case. The second psych. Like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's a mystery. They could be conspiracy theory they're, they're the same, the same person, person. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we're the same person too <gasps> oh my god i had really <laughs> weird deja vu today i was sitting in the playground just like watching the kids at recess and the another teacher said something that i swear she said before and then it led me down this whole train of thinking like i've been here before and the last time that it happened i thought that it had happened before and then someone said the exact same thing in response to what she had said and it was i was like is this real maybe, Am I <laughs> maybe y'all are just boring and have the same conversations wow <laughs> just kidding. you're just a, a wet fucking blanket aren't no, you no deja vu is crazy it, it felt crazy yeah. Felt crazy. Felt crazy. Anyway, I just have one plug today. I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing about our Patreon costume party, but it's tomorrow. Too damn bad. <laughs> Too damn bad. It's tomorrow. We don't want you to forget. Please come hang out with us. We're going to have... Wait. Oh. What? Sorry. I'll Hot. cut it out. I thought we had the wrong date because of the day we're recording this, but no, 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 that was no. my bad. It is tomorrow as of when you're hearing this, not in real life. And if you're listening to it after October 28th, the <laughs> it's too late. Well, there will be more. But if you're listening to it right now on October 28th, <laughs> when this episode comes out, um, it is tomorrow. So join us on Patreon. If you're not there already, you get to just come hang out with us. Hopefully we'll see some good costumes. I know yeah. I'm super excited. I'm excited too. I feel like I dropped the ball on uh, this costume today because I'm planning a really good costume for next week. And I just didn't have it in me for two costumes it's gonna be the costume that matters yes the costume that matters we'll definitely post pictures but if you want to see them in person come to patreon i uh, don't do crafts i don't make things and i'm gonna attempt to make my costume so we'll see how it goes <laughs> probably not good <laughs> <laughs> Haley's dying right now <laughs> speaking of things not going good <laughs> <laughs> my throat is not going good. <laughs> my throat is not going good, too. I've had the worst <laughs> sore throat all week. I just breathed in wine. I'm just so. trying to fill the space here. <laughs> <laughs> just like, and that's all. And that's Folks. the story of my medical ailment. <laughs> okay, well, I think we should get started. I think so, too. I think it's high time. Uh, I, we breathalyzed. <laughs> I blew a point oh seven two seven. <laughs> 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 She's driving tonight. Well, 0.08 is the legal limit, so I could drive even if I blow 0.07. Well, you probably shouldn't, though. No, I shouldn't. I don't drive, like, at all when I've been drinking <laughs> even a little bit, even if I'm, like, well Until below. Tonight. Well, but I, <laughs> I'm not going to, like, drink much more, and we're going to record for two hours, and then I'll be fine. Understandable. Okay, sure. I'll probably sure, be at sure. a zero but once I get behind the wheel. Yeah, Definitely. Okay, I blew a point zero one seven. So you okay. are going so first. I'm going first. This is a highly requested topic by many people over and over again. And I'm finally fucking doing it for a Halloween episode. So y'all bitches can get off my back. Just kidding. I like I'm recommendations. I'm so curious. <laughs> what? You got all the recommendations because you're on the fucking Instagram. I it's know. not fair. I get to hog them. Um, you can get on there too. You have the login, don't you? No, because you never know what the password I is. I know what the password is now. What I know is what it, it is now. Well, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me later. <laughs> okay. 
My the vast majority of my information came from an amazing Smithsonian mag article called The Strange and Mysterious History of the Ouija Board by Linda Rodriguez McRobbie. So this is a comprehensive history of the Ouija board. I should have brought my Ouija board. Yeah, you should have. That yeah. was Really oh well, dumb of you. it's not like we can like play on air. That would be really boring <laughs> for everyone listening. <laughs> Night creepy. Night creepy. <laughs> that would make audio. terrible content. <laughs> it's fine for a video, but audio <laughs> it would not work <laughs> unless they came through the speakers. Ooh, that would be cool. A Ouija board, also called a spirit board or a talking board, is a flat cardboard or wooden board. How many times? Drink every time I say board. Labeled with the letters of the alphabet and numbers zero through nine, the words yes, no, and sometimes the words hello and goodbye. I wish it had a spot that said maybe. Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) I wish it had a spot that said like fuck my ass or like just something really (laughs) vulgar. (laughs) What in the pink doing this thing? Yeah. (laughs) I think it's the other way around, but oh well. <laughs> One in the pink, two in the pink. Not so Haley like that. <laughs> I just, it's on the top of my mind because I was looking up fucked up Halloween costumes and one was literally like the that. shocker. The shocker, yeah. <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> one in the pink, one in the stink. Wait, how do you dress up as the shocker? It was just like a po- like a polyester like a Halloween <laughs> costume of like this, the shocker. Oh my god, that's and so pre- embarrassing. That's like when people put that sticker on their car. <laughs> I thought it was I love you in sign language at first. <laughs> you get it and wear it to school. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> oh, well, I think I figured out what I mean for Halloween. <laughs> oh, my oh my gosh! gosh. You know that um, book, The Kissing Hand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's like the adult version. That's like the fucking hand. I guess it would be so funny <laughs> to buy that book. And I guarantee you, they make shocker stickers, and you yeah. could just put a little sticker over all the like little cute little raccoons hands yeah. <laughs> the shocking hand <laughs> at the end of the book it has the i love you hand in sign language and it could just be a shocking hand <laughs> A book that's called Go the Fuck to Sleep. That's like the kids book, but it's so explicit. Oh my god. Okay, I'm quitting okay. teaching. I'm becoming an author and a voiceover person. There you go. You're and a shocker. Your whole career. <laughs> and a shocker. You you like become the mo- world's most famous voiceover person, but like it's written into your contract that you like have to be allowed to wear the shocker costume. <laughs> that's my uniform. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, you don't have to have a uniform. I'm like, oh, don't oh, I though? <laughs> but I do. <laughs> I don't think you know me. I don't think you know what this is all about. <laughs> you don't get it. <laughs> I can't even do it. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Ouija boards. It uses a planchette, which is a small piece of wood or plastic with a hole in the middle, and it can be moved over the surface of the board to spell words during a seance. Participants place their fingers on the planchette to charge it with their spiritual energy so that the spirits can move it and answer their questions. What? <laughs> Tommy thinks you were faking it that one time we did the Ouija board and it said Zozo. I was not faking it. I know you weren't faking it. <laughs> At least I don't think you were. Tommy sent me a video on Instagram <laughs> of the guy like farting and then there's a ghost. <laughs> and I still refuse to click on it because I swear to God, it's just going to be a guy farting and I don't want to <laughs> see it. It's so ridiculous. I I laughed. It is it's pretty dumb, but I don't believe him. He told me it's a real ghost and I do not believe him and I refuse to click on it. Could be. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Ouija boards are a direct product of the spiritual movement in the United States. Basically, you know, we've talked about the spiritualist movement a hundred thousand times, but 
everyone was losing loved ones during the Civil War. So that like really sparked this interest in talking to the dead. There were other factors too, but that was like a big catalyst to why spiritualism was so popular in the United States with people wanting to communicate with their lost loved ones. And then, you know, right after there was World War One, not right after, a while after, but still. I mean, it kept going. For as long as Earth has been around. <laughs> Well, right after. Yeah. Right after. I mean, over the course of time. Well, you know, it was like 60 years later. So, and the spiritualist movement lasted like almost 100 years. So, yeah. You know, war. Bing, bang. Bing, bang. I mean, constantly it, in war feels like. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, everyone wanted to talk to the dead. And that's kind of where they got their start. But we can go further back in time than that. The precursor to the Ouija board can be traced all the way back to China around 1100 AD. Documents from the Song Dynasty describe a method of automatic writing called Fu Ji or planchette writing. During a Fuji ritual, a planchette-like device was used to support a stick. So basically, it kind of looked like a planchette, and then there was a hole in it, and a stick kind of like propped up through this thing that holds the stick diagonally touching the sand. It was like on a tray of sand, and the writer would place their hands on the planchette, and the stick would scrape Chinese letters into the sand as messages from the divine. And for me, I'm like, wow, like it's scraping in whole Chinese characters into the sand. How, that seems like a lot. Yeah. How, though, is the planchette not messing up what the stick is doing in the sand? Well, the planchette is holding the stick. So your oh, hand so is the, moving the planchette, which is moving in the, the air. Stick. And the stick is touching the sand. There's two. I think there's there. there's all it seems like there's different ones because I was looking at pictures of this trying to understand it. The plancha is not in the air. Its base is sitting on the sand, but then the stick is sticking like diagonally outward. Oh, So okay. the plancha is scraping the sand, but then the stick is out in front of it. So it's not going over the mm -hmm. characters. Okay. Yeah, it's not like a ruining them. And... Monks and holy leaders would use this method to compose Taoist scriptures, but common people also used it just for a regular divination, kind of like the way people used Ouija boards. Fuji is still commonly practiced in Taoist temples in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and some folk shrines and altars in mainland China. So it's still a practice. People still make these things. Cool. And it's really cool. And for me, I'm like, it takes so much to make the Ouija board do anything. Imagine having to, like, write words in the sand. Like, that's a strong spirit. Maybe it's easier. Maybe they're, like... I feel like it's definitely harder. Yeah. I was just thinking since they're not, like, having to... Like, they can just let their mind flow and do it. Right. It's kind of like automatic writing. Like, spiritualists yeah. would do that, too. So I think it's something very similar to that. Yeah. Um, but it's it's really cool. You should look at pictures of it, uh, listeners. It's neat. I should have included pictures in this, but oh well. Ouija boards uh, are very similar, I think, to Fuji, especially with the planchette and like placing your hands on it. So I think they are probably definitely inspired by them. But the boards as we know them were not a thing until February of 1891 when they appeared on the shelves of a Pittsburgh novelty and toy shop. The box described a toy as a novelty device that answered questions, quote, about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. The Ooh. board would offer a, quote, never failing amusement and recreation for all classes and a link, quote, between the, uh, the known and unknown, the material and the immaterial. That makes it sound so fun. Mm -hmm. My mom, I mean, I know it is now, um, but my mom is like, do not fuck with the Ouija board like she hates hearing yeah. about when we a <laughs> do lot it. of people are terrified of them and we'll hear why but it's really interesting the they're they have quite the arc the original Ouija board is pretty much exactly the same as the one sold now it has not changed very much the only real difference is the old ones were made out of wood and they cost a dollar fifty the history of the Ouija board was extremely ambiguous. There wasn't like a lot written down about it until Ouija historian Robert Murch began his research in 1992. So he's the guy who kind of like went digging in all the newspaper archives and um, interviewed the family who owns the Ouija board and who patented it and kind of got this cool history. 
Like I said earlier, the Ouija board was a direct result of the American spiritual movement in the Victorian era. A common part of seances at this time was communication with spirits through knocking. So spirits could knock to spell words, and each number of knocks was a letter. So like A is one knock, and then like 20 knocks is whatever. (coughs) <coughs> I mean, just do Morse code at that point. Right. It took fucking forever. It was tedious and super boring. And someone would have to sit there and like interpret everything and count. And it sucked ass. So the solution was the Ouija board. It made this so much faster. In 1886, I think actually that's 18. No, 1886. That's right. It was reported that a new tool had been introduced to a spiritualist camp in Ohio And this new tool was essentially a homemade Ouija board, and they were calling it the talking board. All the way in Baltimore, a businessman named Charles Kennard read this article, and he saw an opportunity. He got an idea, which he pitched to four other investors, Elijah Bond, who was a lawyer, Washington Bowie, who was a surveyor, and then two others who were not named in this article. None two of- others who are not important. <laughs> they are not important. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. None of them were spiritualists. They were just businessmen who saw an opportunity to make a lot of money, and they did. They created a prototype and began testing it. One day they were trying it out with Bond's sister-in-law, Helen Peters, who was a, quote, strong medium. Together they were sitting around a table. (laughs) (laughs) Strong medium. That's just what she was. (laughs) That's the quote. Um, She was a medium medium. Yeah, she was was a small medium. She was a weak medium. (laughs) It's like trying to order at fucking Starbucks. (laughs) She was a strong grande. (laughs) So they were sitting around the board one day and they asked the board what they should call it because they had this idea. I don't think they wanted to call it the talking board. They wanted like their own name that they could market. Oh, the board spelled out Ouija. When they asked what it meant, it replied, good luck. So kind of creepy. That's how the board got its name. So it doesn't mean anything in any language. Well, when it was marketed, they claimed that Ouija meant good luck in an ancient Egyptian. That's not true, but they but put that on the box. Said. Yeah, they, okay. they said that. <laughs> Later on, it was advertised that the name was a combination of the French word for yes, which of course is we, and the German word for yes, which is ja. So those two together spell Ouija. They're like, just make it work. Right. Just make it make sense. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> Anytime I use the Ouija board, that's <laughs> what I'm thinking. I, actually, that's pretty much just me all the time. <laughs> right. And in actuality, Helen at the time was wearing a locket and inscribed on the back, it said Ouija. So that's probably where it actually got its name. But the cool story that we know now is that the board spelled that out and it said it means good luck. Right. I mean, I'm sure the board definitely could have spelled that out through the direction of of (laughs) her fingers right (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly now that they had the name all the group needed was a patent and they couldn't get a patent unless they were able to prove that the board actually worked so bond brought peters the helen to the patent office in washington dc to prove the board's legitimacy is that what you have to do to get a patent you have to prove it works well if you're going to put on the box that it works Yes, you do. <laughs> huh. I've been j- I'm thinking like shake weights in like the wine and crime episode from this week. Yeah. Like those are patented. Those don't work. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe the laws were different in the 1800s, but. Maybe. I- <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Seems like not much has really changed, but maybe right. patent laws. Pro- you know, that's probably what they've been working on all this time. I just know they had to <laughs> prove it. Maybe to put like, you know, the guaranteed seal, this works yes. on the package. They needed to do this. So they brought it to the pack- patent office. They brought Helen, you know, because she's a strong medium. And the patent officer told them that if the board could accurately spell his name, which I guess he hadn't introduced himself, which rude. So they didn't know his name. And he's like, if the board can spell my name, you get your patent. That th- This is how I will know it works. Okay. They sat down, Helen and Bond put their fingers on it. And miraculously, it spelled his name. 
<laughs> what was his name? I don't know. I wow. wish I knew. I tried to find it and I couldn't. His name was Robert. Zuberg. <laughs> <laughs> His name was yes. <laughs> His name was maybe or a shocker. <laughs> and Bond, the guy who brought this to the office, was a patent attorney. So it's possible that maybe he knew this guy's um, name. <laughs> yeah, if they're, you know, mingling in the same office exactly. sometimes. And also he's a patent attorney. So are you really not going to grant this guy a patent? But he was probably just fucking around. That's probably just a little anecdotal note. He was like, oh, all right. right let's write out these papers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's the story. And apparently the patent officer was shook and gave them a patent for a quite quote 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 <laughs> i was reading the word toy and trying to say quote <laughs> uh quote toy or game the patent didn't go into detail on why the game works it just stated that it does and for marketing purposes this is actually a good thing because it made it seem more mysterious and that was better this was a huge success huge in huge, huge. <laughs> in 1892 <laughs> it was a Medium success. <laughs> medium success. <laughs> Grande success. <laughs> In 1892, the company had to build a second factory in Baltimore, another two in New York City, and then two in Chicago and one in London. To well, I wish the, the Ouija board would have warned them so they could get manufacturing up to speed. Right. I mean, but th- they, I they guess were they doing it. This was, this was a year later. Okay. It blew up. There's only so much... You can do. <laughs> we just can do. <laughs> we just can do. <laughs> In 1898, one of the original stockholders, William Fold, took over the company. And then just random side note about Fold. He died in 1927 by falling off the roof of a brand new factory he had just built. And apparently he had been instructed to build that factory by the Ouija board. How do we know he fell? And didn't uh, jump. I I don't know. All I knew know is that he fell. Okay. Maybe he jumped. I don't know. Dang, that's yeah. scary. Not crazy, but basically, like, if the Ouija board didn't tell him to build that factory, he wouldn't have died. The Ouija board's like, this is my company now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Took forever to spell it, but he got the message. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. It'd be funny if they're like different <laughs> accents bringing it all comes back. There are different accents it can pick before it proceeds. Oh what it my gosh. Like there's accents all around yeah. the edge of the board and it picks an accent and then yeah. spells it. It just is like a, a miniature map of the world and it like just shows you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this is a business idea. We're just leveling up. That was we a medium are. success. This is going to be a big success. Huge. And, or, you know, next time we play Ouija board, the first question should just be, what is your accent? Yes. Yeah. 100%. I've always wondered, like, how do ghosts, like, can they all, like, can they just speak and translate into whatever language the person receiving the language is getting or like I feel like they probably just speak the language they know right I don't know I don't know either I'm not a ghost yeah and I'm like how could ghosts be like stopped by the physical world like I feel like if you're a ghost you could just like go wherever you want to go maybe you can again I'm not a ghost I don't know maybe that's why sometimes the Ouija board doesn't make sense because it's in a language it's in ghost language yeah. yeah they have their own lost shit lost in translation that's right lost and dead <laughs> The board has continued to be hugely successful over the next 120 years. The most popular times for the Ouija board are in times of great uncertainty when people are desperate for answers and or when a lot of people are dying. It experienced a big surge in the 1910s during World War I and then again in the Prohibition area of the 1920s. Then during the Great Depression, the company had to open several new factories to keep up with demand. What? 
Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. Yeah. Actually. I know. In just five months in 1944, a store in New York sold 50,000 boards. So like right around World War II. You can literally make your own Ouija board. Like, I that's know. That's so funny. But like we also buy Ouija boards. Do you remember that one yeah. time we tried to make our own? Yeah. And it did. was terrible. It was awful. We it, used it's like much better. an upside down wine glass and it did not work. <laughs> <laughs> it did, yeah, it didn't. I'm yeah. just picturing being in the Great Depression. Right. People were spending like their last dollar, it sounds like, on Ouija boards. People will spend fucking money on mm-hmm. things that they really care about. Well, also, when uh, people are experiencing extreme poverty, a lot of people will like invest in entertainment like that mm-hmm. because it's just like like you need something to get your mind off shit. It makes yeah. total sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, in 1967, so this is during the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, the Summer of Love, all this kind of like social unrest, Ouija outsold Monopoly with two million in sales. Who buys Monopoly anymore? Right. <laughs> well, back then that it was sense. like okay. it was like the game. The game, yeah. And that's not two million dollars in sales. That is two million Ouija Jeez. boards sold. Yeah. yeah, Monopoly was like the best source of entertainment. All almost right behind the Ouija board. <laughs> right like, between I mean, the hoop and stick. Yeah. I don't know what people played with back <laughs> How then. How else am I going to be entertained for seven and a half hours? Right. <laughs> <laughs> So with so many people using them, stories were bound to pop up. You know, it's it became infamous, not super quickly, but it's, I don't know, like there's always that intrigue with it. And so there's like some news articles that are kind of wild. In 1921, the New York Times reported that a Chicago woman was sent to a psychiatric hospital after keeping her mother's dead body in her living room for 15 days before burying it in her backyard. Oh, no. And her defense was that she only did it because her Ouija board told her to. What? I know. It told her to. So her mom died and she's like, what do I do now? And she's like, okay, I guess I have to let her rot in her bed for 15 days. It just said yes. Yeah. (laughs) She's like, I know exactly what to do. (laughs) But in a much more real sense, I have no idea what to do. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) In 1930, a woman committed murder, supposedly because the Ouija board told her to. In 1941, a 23-year-old gas station attendant in New- told the New York Times he joined the army because the board told him to. Well, the U.S. patent law says that it works, so that woman can't be convicted of murder and right. all these other things. <laughs> That's I mean. true. She was just, fo- like, <laughs> if she's convicted of murder, the Ouija board has to be convicted as an accomplice. Yes, it must. It mm-hmm. must. Mm-hmm. And those two guys and the other other in- unimportant guys, <laughs> my words. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yes. Also them. <laughs> In 1958, a woman named Helen Dow Peck tried to leave her $152,000 fortune to John Gale Forbes. I thought you were going to say to her Ouija board. Well, kind of, because John Gale Forbes was not a real person. He was a spirit that she had contacted on her Ouija board. No, it's like that woman who married the dead pirate. Yeah, it's just like that. And then they got a divorce. He her, yeah. <laughs> No, I know. honey, uh, honey, no. This did not hold up in court after her death. <laughs> you should have left it to a podcaster who's also a teacher who would be alive much later than after you died. You should have. Oh had my the foresight. god! Can you imagine? Put us in your life insurance policy, everyone listening. Why not? Right? Like, who what? else are you going to give it to? Right, your cat. We'll take That's care of fine your cat. Too. We can. Yeah. Yeah. Bring, bring the cat to us. We can never have enough cats. Give us the money. I know. I want to have a cat of every color. That would be so cute. Every variation. Aww. I'm ready to fully embrace the crazy cat lady. I know. I want an orange cat. Really bad. I had an orange cat named Sinbad when I was a kid, and Aww. he was the sweetest little cat. I want a gray cat. Aww. I want the gray scale. Oh, yeah. A whole gray scale, like going white to safty. Yeah. Yeah. That would That's be cool. The plan. You should do it. So, and then I'll you just... line them all up. 
have and to not ask Tommy. And do <laughs> just it. bring them home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah. Oh yeah, and you have the baby. Yeah. So you just need so I just need a great in between. Cat. Yeah. It's a shame that Safty and Baby are both spayed and neutered because you could probably <gasps> get a grayscale by breeding the perfect, them. Perfect. Yes, breeding brother and sister. <laughs> Stepbrother and stepsister, they'd be very no. popular on Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, cat. God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In 1916, a woman named Pearl Curran began publishing poems that she came, claimed came from communicating with a 17th century English woman named Paintress. 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 <laughs> Patience <laughs> Worth through her Ouija board. Patience Worth. Patience Worth. The next year, her friend Emily Grant Hutchings wrote a book that she claimed was written by Mark Twain, who she talked to with her Ouija board. Did it sound anything like Mark Twain's writing? I doubt it. I really doubt it. <laughs> That's a long time to write a book if it actually came from what the Ouija board was telling her. I know. That must have taken fucking forever. Yeah, the book just says Zozo, Zozo, Zozo. <laughs> <laughs> The next, uh, no, lied. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning poet James Merrill won the National Book Critics Circle Award for his poem, The Changing Light at Sanover, another poem which he claimed he wrote with the help of the Ouija board. And this one was an award winning poem. It was a big deal. Wow. Yeah. Despite the, oh, I'm sorry. Despite a Ouija-inspired murder, every now and then, you know, there's been a few of them over the years. Overall, though, the Ouija board was mostly considered, like, a fun, quirky pastime, not like it is today. So, all in all, it was mostly only renounced by really staunch religious people, like Pope Pius X. He wrote a book in 1919 called The New Black Magic, The Truth About the Ouija Board. So, like, there were definitely were people that thought this thing was, like, bad and satanic, but not black, most people. Black magic seems like something that is always going to be very old. Like, I can't even imagine there being new black magic Anything yeah. that's considered magic to me is just so old. But I mean, people like a staunchly religious people today claim like Wicca and shit and like voodoo and is black magic <laughs> and vaccines. Yeah. Like there's always going to be those people. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to me. Which no, I guess it makes is no sense. A good sign. Right. <laughs> right. I'm glad you're not like Pope Pius. <laughs> what a name, by the way. Yeah. God. I mean, uh, if you're going to be a Pope. Pious Might as well be pious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the alliteration is good too. I'll give him that. That's true. It's a good one. <laughs> For the most part, by the vast majority of people, this was considered a safe and appropriate game for children, families, and even Christians. It was featured in a Norman Rockwell painting. And as you probably know, he's just like the painter of, you know, domestic tranquil bliss in the United States. It was also in an episode of I Love Lucy. So it was very casual. It was not at all the way we think of Ouija boards today. Like, can you imagine a Ouija board being in like a primetime like sitcom? No. No. So something changed. Something really changed. Everything was the silly. The satanic panic. And fun. Could it be? That's a good guess. And it definitely like got worse in the satanic panic. But the turning point happened in 1973. Okay. Do you know what happened? No. The Exorcist came out. <gasps> ah! <laughs> ah, okay. Yes. The documentary, yes. The Exorcist. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I'm familiar. based on a true story. <laughs> so basically <Yeah>. a documentary. <laughs> yes. The Good. documentary The Exorcist came out. And if you haven't seen it, in the movie, 12-year-old Reagan becomes possessed by a demon after playing the Ouija board by herself. People were fucking scared of this movie. Like, my grandpa would tell me, he was a big Catholic, and he told me that, like, he walked out of the theater during this movie. Like, he wanted to throw up. It was the scariest shit people had ever seen. People were having anxiety attacks in the theater. They were fainting. People even had heart attacks. Like, this was... What? This is, like, what really brought on, like, the modern horror movie movement as we know them. Like, this wow. was the scariest shit people had ever seen. And it featured a Ouija board. So now the Ouija board was connected to the demonic 
and this really fucking scary shit that was supposedly, you know, based on a true story. Think of all the dead people who are pissed because now they're, <laughs> they like to communicate with yeah. the Ouija board and they're good people. Now no They're one, not demonic. No, now no one talks to them and that's just sad. It's rude, honestly. It it's very they rude. soiled their name. Right. Everyone get a Ouija board and talk to the dead. They're lonely. Yeah. Soups. <laughs> soups loans. So now the Ouija board is considered to, by many to be a tool of the devil. It's not a way to talk to friendly spirits, but to invite demons. <laughs> it makes me want to use it more when you put it like that. <laughs> In 2001, in Alamo Gordo, New Mexico, Ouija boards were burned in mass bonfires. Alamo Gordo? Yeah. (laughs) Alamo Gordo. Okay, okay. You fat Alamo. Right. So they're being burned in like like book burning style. Like they're demonic. (laughs) Catholic.com calls Ouija boards, quote, far from harmless. And that's a sentiment shared by many Christians who's, quote, spiritual spiritual oh my god scripture scripture would make more sense (laughs) denouncing communication with the dead through mediums and it's not just religious communities that are afraid of ouija boards i feel like it's just like a really popular thing even if you're not religious to be scared of ouija boards like if you believe in ghosts or demons at all i feel like most people are fearful of them yeah my heart starts pumping a little bit it's fun but it also is scary because you don't no, there's so you much unknown know. about it. So much unknown. And also just like the media representation is just like, this is how you get a demon. Yeah. So like that obviously makes it really scary. And part of the fear around them is that they work. Like oh, they I, do yeah. work and it's scary. But they don't necessarily work because of the supernatural. They what? might, they might, I, I, I like to think they do, but they really work because of something called the ideomotor effect. In 1852, a physician and physiologist named William Benjamin Carpenter published a report studying the automatic muscular movements, basically small movements of our body that occur subconsciously. The ideomotor effect states that a person's body can move and respond without the brain being consciously aware. And that's totally true. Like our heart beats, we breathe. Our body does do things without our mind being conscious of it. So it does other things too, like twitches and small movements that can influence a planchette. Uh, People quickly, so this theory came out in the mid 1800s, like height spiritualist movement, and people quickly began like applying this phenomenon to spiritualist practices, especially like table turning, things like that. Things like dousing rods, pendulums, and of course, Ouija boards are really susceptible to this, these muscle movements because little, the tiniest little movements on any of these things have a big effect. Yeah. You can be holding a pendulum. You don't see your hand move, but you see the pendulum swing. Same thing with Ouija boards. Because planchettes, you know, they're usually really light. They have smoothed or felted feet. They glide really, really easily. So it's really easy to move them. Even if you don't see your hand move, the planchette might move. And usually with Ouija boards, you're doing it in a group of people. So everyone's moving it a little bit, whether they mean to or not. (laughs) Because the ghost is making my hands move. Right. Very small. My hand (laughs) has this energy and it moves a little bit and then the ghost directs it. We're all in this (laughs) together. Once we know who we are. I don't know the words. (laughs) That's all I know is that we're all in this together. (laughs) Me too. That's all we got in You made it pretty far. Thank you. I'm impressed. And we take... I don't know. I really don't know the words. I was never a high school musical girl. Were you? I remember High School Musical 2 coming out Mm. and watching it live on Disney Channel. And like we paused it 
to go get some popcorn or something and ran back and we we're like we have to be watching it live right now and it like had skipped <gasps> past the commercials no. and into the movie and we like missed where it picked up after commercials and we we're like we don't care like, <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why it was very it was a very fleeting obsession that's funny but, yeah, yeah. i got the cd from claire's oh wow oh yeah, yeah. it's a great soundtrack i got the dvd for christmas the original high school musical and I remember like trying to watch it but I was distracted because I was like at somebody else's house and then I just never like I was never like into it but you saying that you watched it live on Disney Channel I remember when Camp Rock came out oh yeah Joe was, Jonas oh my god I was fucking obsessed with the Jonas Brothers and I waited for weeks and then watched it live and I was so excited that was, and it was so good I forgot about Camp Rock I know and Man. then I was so jealous of Demi Lovato. What a weird time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, just weird. I know. Who else was in that? Was Selena? No, Selena Gomez it wasn't was in that. Demi right? Lovato and the Jonas Brothers. And those were the main people. And then okay. that one girl who's on Disney Channel who like has the big brown eyes. Debbie Ryan. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Not be being launched into my childhood <laughs> right. immediately just at the I'm drop I'm having of. flashbacks. <laughs> I was on a beach vacation with my family and I was like, no, we're not going to the beach. I'm going to sit in this motel room and watch Camp Rock. What? Yeah. You did that? I did that. Oh, my <laughs> God. That's so funny. It was very important to me. <laughs> anyway, so Ouija boards might not actually be the best at reaching the dead, but they can offer important insights on the living. Researchers at the University of British Columbia's Visual Cognition Lab think that Ouija boards may offer good intel on how our brain processes information on various different levels. Our brains have different levels of processing. There's the conscious, unconscious, subconscious, preconscious, and Small, zombie mind. Medium and large. Small, <laughs> medium, and large. Tall, grande, vente. That's all you gotta know. Simplified down, it's just grande and tall. So you have your conscious. And your subconscious. Your conscious, of course, is like your thoughts you can pinpoint, your inner monologue. Unconscious are things your brain does automatically, like blinking. Ouija words are used to study our non-conscious knowledge and whether our unconscious ideomotor movements can express what our unconscious knows. Like, think about when they tested the Ouija board in the patent office what if they had like walked by the nameplate on that guy's door or like heard a coworker say his name? Like they wouldn't have been able to recall that information if they were asked, but maybe their subconscious Weird. picked up on it and it was able to direct them to the right answer without them knowing they were the ones doing it. So we subconsciously know there is a demon in right. our house with it saying Zozo. <laughs> That's exactly right. We know it to be true. The demon helped me out today. Really? How? Well, I have been missing my eyebrow pencil. And finally, I just said out loud, like, can you like, please help me find my eyebrow pencil. And I have all my makeup is like in the same spot. And I had looked under the little cart that it's on. And like, I had looked everywhere because it's my favorite one. And I just went ahead and did it with the one that I don't like today. And then as I was coming back to like finish my setting spray, it was just like right there Whoa. next to my jewelry. Yeah. That's crazy. Very weird. That is weird. I know. Well, we have a helpful demon. We do. <laughs> Tell them to return our eyebrow tweezers. We've lost two oh, pairs. Yeah, we always... Maybe our ghost loves eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, I think I think he might. He or, or she. He hates them. And that's why he takes everything that makes or our eyebrows look nice. he loves them and wants us to just let them be all natural. Oh, he loves a natural eyebrow. Yeah. Ooh. He's like, I didn't get the luxury of nice eyebrows, <laughs> so you don't either. <laughs> We'll have to ask him with our Ouija board. Oh, yeah. We'll go home and ask him where our eyebrow tweezers are because you're right. I'm missing them, too. And he'll say, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Dr. Ron Rensink decided to test this theory that your ideomotor effect could unlock unconscious knowledge. The experiment involved a robot and a human test subject. The robot and the subject played Ouija board with a planchette. 
So both of them are touching the same planchette, but the participant was told that the robot was mimicking another person's movements in the other room. So the person playing the planchette didn't know that the robot was the like moving it. They thought it was someone else essentially controlling it. Mm. But really what the robot was doing was mimicking the person's movements the person it was playing with oh okay so whenever they moved a little bit the robot would do the same thing but like a little bit bigger of a movement okay does that make sense i follow you okay the participant was asked a series of yes or no trivia questions and they answered a bunch of them verbally and then they answered a bunch of them with the ouija board verbally the participants got the questions right about 50 percent of the time so like what you would expect from random chance on the ouija board when they believed they were getting help from the unknown they answered correctly about 65 percent of the time what Uh uh-huh so maybe somewhere along the way they heard this fact or it's stored somewhere in their brain and they don't know that they know they don't know they know wow that reminds me of math class in like (laughs) seventh grade i was it was like shop basically but we were making computers and my teacher asked me a a math question i just like said the number and he was like yes and i was like whoa (laughs) yeah i was like (laughs) I don't know that. Yeah. (laughs) That's like when you're taking a multiple choice test. I mean, unless you like really check your answer and you're sure you shouldn't change your answers. Like if you're between two things and you answer one thing and then you're second guessing and you change it, you shouldn't do that. You should always go with the first thing you did because it's like your unconscious recall memory. Yeah. And just in life, trust Trust your gut. gut. (laughs) Yeah. 100%. The group was like, whoa, this is fucking crazy. And they were able to replicate their findings with another experiment. This time, two people, like actual people, no robots, were playing the Ouija board. Then one person was blindfolded. They continued to play. And the second person sneaked away. So then there was only one person touching it. They snuck away. They just were like, "Eh," yeah, like backed out. Yeah. Slowly. Literally, they snuck away. And then the first person was like. Okay, I'm I'm the captain now. Well, they didn't know because they were blindfolded. Oh, right. I yeah. well, not right. I didn't hear that. <laughs> okay, they're blindfolded. <laughs> the I'm other the person <laughs> sneaks away. They're the captain now, but they don't know they're the captain. Okay, they still think there's another person touching their it. Their hearts know. They know in their heart, but not really because their brain. They like still complain <laughs> like. These people sat there all by themselves without the other person there. The planchette was moving around and they were sitting there complaining that the other person was moving it when really they were what? moving it. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> what? And the findings were replicated. 50% accuracy with verbal responses and again, 65% accuracy with Ouija responses. This is insane. Uh-huh. I know. Isn't that crazy? I'm looking at playing with a Ouija board totally differently now. (laughs) Same. It's wild. And basically what this does is give credibility to the hypothesis that we know more than we think we do. And our ideomotor activity can reveal some of that hidden knowledge. Obviously, like these aren't perfect scientific experiments, but it opens the door for more research to be done on this topic. And it's really exciting, especially like studying the way this recall memory works for maybe doing research on neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's. So it's actually really cool that Ouija boards can be used in this type of way. I love it. Works. It, <laughs> it works. They're- they don't know <laughs> what it works for, but they know it works and they're going to make money. <laughs> Who's making money? The two important guys and the two other non-important oh, okay. guys. Okay, we're throwing it back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Throwback. <laughs> Throwback. Yes. yes, they 100% make a lot of money. And Hasbro now has the rights and they're probably making a shit to ton of money. The Ouija board. The Ouija patent. Yeah. Ouija. I keep mm-hmm. saying Ouija. Yeah. Maybe you can say it either way. It's spelled Ouija, but I think it's Ouija. Okay. Yeah. Either way. They, <laughs> either they make way, a lot it's, made up. <laughs> it's made up. It's made up. Yeah. So Ouija boards are useful and important. They're not scary. They don't open a portal to hell and we should all play with them. They're fun. I want to end this lesson with a list of helpful Ouija tips if you're going to play. This is from (laughs) scarymommy.com. Okay. (laughs) Number one, don't use it alone. Number two, use it in a dark, quiet place free of distractions. 
And <laughs> in Memphis, when people say I need to use the bathroom, they say I need to use it. Yeah. And <laughs> that's just what's making me think of don't use it alone. Use it in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use it in a graveyard. Uh, that's because Why? there's too many ghosts and they'll all be trying to put in their two cents. So it'll be chaotic. You wanna, like, want to like only talk to one ghost. I want to experience that, but we, we tried that. When did we? we at the Crystal Grotto. Oh, yeah, we did do it in the Crystal Grotto. But you know what? Like maybe there weren't spirits in the Crystal Grotto because there's so much quartz and that like yeah. neutralizes spiritual energy. We should go to a cemetery. I don't care if we play with the Ouija board or not, but we should go. Just for fun? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You've never done that before? No, I like walking around cemeteries. There's this really cool cemetery in Seattle right by Volunteer Park. Um, my Seattle friends will know what I'm talking about. And it's like the coolest cemetery. Bruce Lee is buried there. And he has like this big grave and people leave stuff on it. It's pretty cool. Cool. Yeah. We should do that. Uh-huh. Uh, you are blah, blah, blah. Um, you can ask it anything, but don't believe everything you hear. Number five, it's polite to ask the spirit to introduce themselves. Number six, in order to not confuse the spirit or scatter energy, you're supposed to have one person designated to ask the questions. You're also asked, you should also refrain from asking silly questions or saying that you don't believe in it as that <laughs> lowers the energy. Are you wearing underwear? <laughs> <laughs> what's up dog <laughs> assign someone uh to write down letters as the spirit spells things number eight always end the session with goodbye number nine if you don't trust the vibes of the spirit say goodbye and close the board and finally number 10 sage the room with your when you're done in order to clear any lingering energy and that's Ouija boards. Wow, this is really getting me in the mood. Me too. Let's For Ouija boards. Ouija boards. <laughs> My sources are Taoist slash sorcery dot blogspot dot com, Fuji Wiki, uh, Idea Motor Phenomenon Wiki, Ouija board Wiki, uh, the Smithsonian Mag article called "The Strange and Mysterious History of the Ouija Board" by Linda Rodriguez McRobbie. Far Out Magazine and theconversationalist.com. And that was my lesson on Ouija boards. And Scary Mommy. And Scary Mommy. Yeah, it's all sight her <laughs> twice. <laughs> wow. Thank you for that. I really want to do the Ouija board now. Me too. Let's do it. I mean, Halloween is coming up. We can definitely play Ouija board on I Halloween. I want to open the portal to hell. I'm ready. And we have two Ouija videos on Patreon. That's if true. If y'all haven't seen those, they're under the night creepy tag. Check them out. They're creepy. They are creepy. And it's nighttime. Yeah, the Crystal Night Grotto creepy. they mentioned is on Patreon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that place mm -hmm. is freaking sweet. It is sweet. If anything, just go on there to look at a video of the Crystal Grotto because it's yeah. badass. It's like a crystal shrine in this old-ass cemetery. And it's a cool video that it Alec is. edited and put together. Mm -hmm. So check it out. Check it. Check it. All right. That was our ad. <laughs> we're going right in yeah let's do it okay so this is a part two for carl's corpse brides so if you have not listened to last week's episode i would go back um but if you have let's get into it as soon as my computer reconnects to the wi-fi <laughs> we'll be all good to go okay so Picking up where we left off. So Carl has this corpse, Elena, in this airplane hangar that is on his government property. And he gets a new boss. And his boss is like, bro, you can't park your hangar here. And he's like, okay, okay, I can move it. And he's like, okay, this is, I mean, not only an airplane hanger to move, but it's my dead girlfriend's stolen corpse. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, he's confident enough in his restoration of the airplane, and he's comfortable enough in his restoration of his girlfriend <laughs> that he can move it all with Elena in it. So he decides to move himself out of Elena's house and essentially move all his stuff into the airplane. And her parents are obviously elated. They're oh so God. glad to be rid of him. And he takes the bed that he had gifted her and had been sleeping in. And he also recruits Elena's brother-in-law, which is in Carl's eyes, his brother-in-law. Because mm -hmm. him and Elena are 
married Mm -hmm. and he's like hey can you help me move my shit and the brother-in-law is like sure that's what brother-in-laws are good for helping you move I mean I don't know why else you would have a (laughs) (laughs) brother-in-law so he has no idea what's in there they hitch the plane to a truck and they just slowly roll it through town on its large tires until they arrived at rest beach and Meanwhile, while all of this is happening, Carl's daughter, Crystal, dies. Like his actual daughter dies. And his actual wife writes him a letter to tell him about it. But he never responds, doesn't attend the funeral, doesn't send any money that she's been like desperately asking him to help. And that's just that. So just a little... Well, if you weren't sure what kind of a guy this was at this point, now you know. Personality (laughs) pick. Yes. So he gets this hanger at Rest Beach. He also has this little shack that Carl moved into after Mario, his brother-in-law, helped him make some repairs. And Carl worked on making this shack into a castle. He wanted it to be grand. He wanted it to be move-in ready for Elena so he could finally have her body out in the open and so she could resurrect from the dead. And that takes a couple of years. In addition to this, he's still working as an x-ray technician at the hospital. And Carl explained in his memoirs that, quote, there was always a surprise waiting for me when I opened the casket, particularly so when she had been sealed up. So what he's like, does she's, he mean by surprise? She means smell. Just like excited to see her. Like he, I, I assume she looks different every time he yeah, opens the she's casket. She's like more decayed. I think it's actually the opposite because he has her in this liquid and I don't know how much further down it is, but she gains about 60 pounds in water weight because she's just absorbing, absorbing it all. Well, yeah, he filled her with like cloth, right? Yeah. So now that's absorbing it. So I think she's starting to look more real during all of this. Oh my God. Carl and Elena... Carl was overjoyed. He says Elena was also overjoyed. Oh, yes. <laughs> Easy to tell. Because she could, she could finally be left out in the open air in this castle shack. In this shack, he made a bedroom and a laboratory in which he kept his transformer for electricity and a large x-ray machine as well as an operating table. And it seems like she stayed in the incubator tank and she was kept in the hangar. And he created this like machine that would circulate the liquid in the tank when she was in there. But he would take her out daily to give her a break. Oh, my God. Give her a break. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Give her a break and bury her. Put her back in the mausoleum. Right. You fucking creep. (sighs) So he would also place her on the x-ray table for five minutes of radiation every day, get her daily dose. How does that help? He thinks that it's going to help resurrect her and bring her back to life. He really thinks she's coming back to life. Yeah, he he really does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, It's suspected that he was stealing this radioactive material from the hospital because it's impossible to get stuff to do x-rays, just like residential x-rays. Yeah. That's impossible. Um, So again, personality pick. Now, one time a woman who was dating a guy who interviewed Carl was they were going to interview him on his land. It was for something with a hospital or something like that. It was just a lot of information I didn't include, but she was included in this book I read. And she was looking around the property while Carl and her boyfriend were talking, and she went up to the airplane hangar, and then Carl rushed over to her, took her by the elbow, and said, nobody goes in that plane. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) No shit. You got to be dead to get in there. (laughs) 
So with this circulating liquid in this incubator tank, like I said, she's gained about 60 pounds in water weight. He had a goal for her to reach 100 pounds total in weight before he could officially resurrect her. He wanted her to be well enough and healthy enough. And at this point, she's at 90 pounds. And his thought process is that the incubation has basically reversed the embalming and she's getting closer to being able to be living again. During this time, the Great Depression is also taking a toll on the United States in general and the Key West. And people have started stealing a lot. Um, A lot of people are out of work. And Carl is really worried about Elena's ability to stay in the incubation tank. So he decided to reapply the silky fake skin all over her body again so that he could just ditch the incubation tank and let her stay out in the air. To protect her, he just laid her in the bed and slept with her every night so that he could keep her safe. Roosevelt's New Deal ended up creating civil projects to get people back to work, and they were cleaning up beaches. That included Rust Beach, which is where his little shack and hangar is. So now all these people are doing projects on the beach, building piers, cleaning it up, and there are just people everywhere. And the guy in charge of this Rust Beach restoration had a grudge against Carl. I don't really know what happened, but they don't like each other. And Carl decides to find another out-of-the-way place. He's like, I got to move everything again. You know, I think he knows what he's doing is kind of sketchy, but he just feels like everyone else doesn't understand. Yeah. (laughs) So... He finds this out-of-the-way place a couple miles away in another old wooden shack. It took him a month to move all of his equipment to this new place. Jesus. He put Elena in the plane cabin and just hitched it to his car and drove over to the new spot. Just so casual. Like, don't mind me. Just, yeah, it's like a little bullet trailer at this point. <laughs> yeah. Just drag it around. They're like, oh, that's just Carl, <laughs> our local x-ray technician. Jesus. At some point, Carl loses his job at the hospital due to budget cuts, and he becomes even more isolated from regular people. There is a lot of speculation about his money coming in because he would go monthly to the post office to pick up a check that was sent to him. And nobody knows the source of this check. A lot of people, again, speculate that he was in the German military and that it was like a pension type thing. Um, He could have made up that story. He says that it came from a machine shop that he owned back in Germany that he had sold and he just got a percentage Mm -hmm. of what they made in a month. Um, But a lot of people think that he made up that story to hide the fact that he was in the German army army. And a lot of people question like if he was so successful with that shop in Germany, why would he have even moved to the U S in the first place? Yeah. So he was getting money. Um, Some people think that it came from an, and inheritance but whatever it was he was still able to live comfortably without a job and still not but he's like in a shack on the beach yeah he's in a shack on the beach and he doesn't pay child support and he's still not actually divorced from his actual wife right so like but he he's scraping by he can buy formaldehyde for his corpse girlfriend yeah and radium if that's what you're asking (laughs) yeah (laughs) i think he stole the radium (laughs) he's like all right babe now that we're uh you know i'm unemployed so i can't really steal from my job because i don't have one anymore so i'm just gonna leave you out and she's like (laughs) she's dead (laughs) <laughs> so at the new place, he just leaves her out and lets mummification take place since he didn't have electricity and he didn't have a laboratory anymore. She would start leaking sometimes, oh. but he would just seal her up 
Seal her up. Seal her up. Put Let some her more, leak out. Put some more silk. Put some more wax on there. No. Just seal her up. No. Let her dry. <laughs> this is the original two in the pink, one in the stick. Oh. <laughs> no. Uh, that's cursed. Don't say that. Oh, that's the real opening of the hole to hell. That's true. <laughs> he would play organ music for her every morning and would make breakfast for the both of them. And he would eat it with her. And then one day on the 29th of July. What is he making uh, in his shack without electricity? I mean, you know, just fucking eggs and bacon. <laughs> Raw eggs. Formaldehyde. And <laughs> I had a student come in my room uh, Two days ago, maybe yesterday, and she comes in carrying an egg in a plastic baggie, and she goes, Miss Barnhart, you know what I learned? And I was like, what? And she goes, raw eggs are healthy for you. And I was like, well, not really. And also, is that a raw egg? And she was like, yep, I'm going to eat it. What? I was like, so it's not hard boiled. She's like, nope, it's raw. (laughs) Girl, (laughs) it's so much easier to just cook your eggs and eat it. Than it is to deal with salmonella. (laughs) Not when you're an eighth grader desperate for attention. (laughs) Not desperate, but like fair. Eighth grade middle schoolers do weird shit for who knows why. Like I did such such weird shit in middle school. Yeah, I think everyone does that when they want attention, whether they know they're doing it or not. Totally. And I don't know if she ate it. All I said was do not eat it in my room. So I don't know what happened to that egg. But maybe he was feeding her raw eggs. They'd probably be good for her skin. Rub them on there. (sighs) Who the fuck knows? (laughs) He was doing something because apparently Elena came back to life. (laughs) Okay. Um, He just noticed that her fingers had started to move. And then she started talking to him. And he says, God bless you, Elena. I'm, I'm so happy you've awakened from your long sleep. Like, this is the moment he's been waiting for. And she said, I've come to stay with you for a while and keep you company. Okay. And he, he's like, Elena, don't be too hasty in getting up. It may exhaust your strength, my darling. Wait a little while. I'll make you some hot beef tea. <gasps> Ew! See, that's the kind of shit he's making in there. <laughs> that's disgusting. That's yeah. worse than a raw egg. He has raw egg vibes for sure. <laughs> yeah, his hot beef tea is literally just like bone marrow and hot sauce. <laughs> Ew. Uh, yeah. So he goes out to make her some hot beef tea. And when she returns, she's still dead. But he just really, he's like, oh, shit, she's still dead. Duh. But then she comes back to life a few hours later. Oh, thank God. And starts talking to him. And now she can also speak German. Wow. Which is I guess we have our We have our answer. Ghosts can speak any language. Yeah. Well, I don't know what better proof there is than this. I know. It's the memoirs of... Carl Tanzler. (laughs) Um, So he thinks that she's come back to life. And he's also leaving her out. She's just out in the open, hanging out, much like I want to be when I die. Just embalm me, let me mummify, keep me on the couch so I can participate in batch night. Mm -hmm. She began to dry out and quickly lost all of the water weight that she had gained, leaving her at around 40 pounds. One day, Carl fell through the deck frames of a a boat, and he couldn't get himself out. He was seriously injured. He broke several ribs, and somehow Carl got himself up and walked back to the house and got some medical treatment. But this was just the beginning of something much worse for Carl. Carl started to have this fear that something bad was going to happen. You might call it anxiety, (laughs) if you're familiar with that. (laughs) Um, So he started to have these anxieties, and they were worsened when Elena started things like, started saying things like, hide me, hide me somewhere, hide me, Carl. (laughs) Oh, God. Imagine your anxiety manifesting, and you think your corpse girlfriend girlfriend is talking to you, telling you, hurry, hide. Well, like, what do you do? Do you uh, hide her? Do you, Are you like, you, shut up, bitch? You get hell. <laughs> like, that's beyond what one man can deal with I all by himself. I think he's 
past that point. <laughs> I don't think he can. I mean, he can only get arrested at this point. He can't get help. Yeah. <laughs> but oh yeah, he God. should have gotten help a long time mm-hmm. ago. Meanwhile, rumors had had begun to bubble around town that Carl was up to something weird. Believe it or not. <laughs> so, in September 28th, 1940, Mario, Carl and Elena's brother-in-law, came to Carl's house to just let him know. He's He came up and he was like, hey, just so you know, um, we realized that Elena's tomb has been, like, broken into and her coffin has been tampered with. So, I don't know if you know what's up or, like, but, like, I just wanted to let you know. So Carl goes to the cemetery, the family's already there, and Elena's sister is like, open the Carl coffin. Open the Carl coffin. Open the Carl coffin. Um, Open the coffin, Carl. And she's just suspicious. And he's like, no, you can't make me open this. And he reassures them that even though the outer coffin has been broken into, the inner one is intact. And it's fine. Everything is fine. And they got to the point where they all agreed and they went home. Elena's family calls him back to the cemetery a few days later. And her sister, Nana, is very upset. As you would be. Carl basically gaslights the fuck out of her saying that, oh, Nana, like you just want to steal Elena's jewels that I gave her that she was buried in. And you're the one who broke into the tomb and you're the one who tampered with her coffin. And why don't you just want to let your sister rest peacefully? What a fucking asshole. Completely. He's just he needs help. And he is now harming other like it's wrong to steal a body and do everything he's done but it's like now these are real actual like living people and they know you're up to something yeah where is the line so nana is like okay just let's open it so i can see her and i know that she's in there and so i won't go crazy because this is really driving me crazy and carl's like okay you can see her But let's just talk this out in private, eh? What do you think about that? Is he going to kill her? They agree to go back to Carl's shack and talk about it in private. And Carl brings her to the bedroom and lifts the blanket of the bed and shows Nana Elena's mummified body. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being that sister? No, absolutely not. The horror. She doesn't believe that it's Elena. (gasps) She's like, no. And he's like, yes, she's fine. She looks better than ever. Are we at the next (laughs) slide? She's lost 60 pounds. (laughs) No, we're not at the next slide. I'm so anxious to look at the next slide. I mean, you can definitely show it. It just shows the picture of what she looked like when she was alive and when when she has passed on. That does not look like her. (laughs) He's like, she's fine. And her sister is like, no, that's that's not Elena. There's no way. I mean, like, uh, there's no way. I mean, yeah. And then she's like, well... If that is her, like, I mean, what is that and how long has it been here? And he's like, um, seven years. It's, it's been, it's, it's been, been seven, seven years. Seven years. No. Oh my God. After hearing that, Nana doesn't believe that this is her sister. And she urges her husband to go back to the cemetery and break the coffin open. Essentially, all Nana wants is for Carl to return the body to the tomb. She just wants her sister to rest in peace. And Carl agrees, but he says that he will not be doing so until the time is right and that he can join her in death. Then they can be buried together no uh, because it's all about him right right? he has to be in control yeah yeah listen for for what i need i have to blast your sister's corpse with the radioactive waves 
and she'll be brought to life and then we can live out our lives together because my fake ancestor told me that I was going to marry her. So and he wants to like you. shoot her body into outer space, right? Yeah, does yeah. he still want to do that? that? I mean, that's the ultimate goal. It's why okay. he's restoring this airplane. Right, it's all part of the odyssey. Because airplanes go to outer space. Airplanes go to outer As space, and there's enough mm-hmm. radioactive energy and mm-hmm. rays in the outer space to resurrect human beings. Obviously, this is science. <laughs> he's what a do you scientist. mean? <laughs> he's an expert. <laughs> He's an expert. Um, so Nana just wants her body to be buried or back in the tomb. Carl also wants the same thing, but not yet. So Nana and Mario leave. Carl sits in his house, just riddled with anxiety for five days, worrying about what's to come. I would go straight to the authorities. Yeah. Why haven't they definitely. done that? Well, they, they do eventually. Okay. Police and f- funeral cars arrive outside Carl's home on October 5th, 1940, and Carl is charged with being in possession of a dead body. So they load him into the back of the police cars, and he is enraged when they see them taking her body out of the house and placing it in the hearse. The audacity! They took her body to the funeral home until everything was settled. He can't believe them. He thinks they're insane. Clearly, this story spreads quickly. Carl and Elena are instantly famous. The press was all over him. Carl was booked at the county jail under the charge of, um, I should have looked up how to pronounce this, wanton and maliciously demolishing, disfiguring, and destroying a grave. Is it wanton? W A N T O N? I think so. Wanton. I don't even know what that means, honestly. Yeah. According to Carl, Elena Spirit visited him in jail every night. She comforted him. She told him not to worry because soon he would be set free. An attorney, attorney named Luis A. Harris volunteered to represent Carl in court. Harris was considered one of the most capable lawyers in the state. And Harris was like, I want this case. Why, though? Probably the publicity. Yeah, I guess. And just knowing that, like, they could figure something out. For Carl, I think it's probably publicity. Yeah, Whether people it's good love or attention. Bad. Yeah, we all love attention. <laughs> That's <laughs> unfortunately <Yeah>. true. <laughs> and real quick, wanton is deliberate and unprovoked. Okay. Okay. Yes, very deliberate. <laughs> um, unprovoked wanton. for wanton. Ooh. Wanton. Ew, why does That's that have a voice like that? ghostly? That yeah. was her voice. It was wanton. Elena. That was the yeah. corpse's voice. <laughs> Elena. Um. So he has this banging lawyer who does his case pro bono. And even more surprising, people arrived at the jail to console Carl. And a lot of people in the public stood with him and what he did in this case. A lot of women thought that what Carl had done was romantic and went and men were sympathetic to him. So fucking weird. <laughs> it's like, what is wrong with were people? Were things really that bad in the 40s? And then you hear this and you're like, oh, yeah. 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 But like, I feel like it, people are still that stupid today. Oh, that's yeah. It's true. Trump- like, if Trumpers. this happened, that's yeah. what I was thinking. I'm like, MAGA, this is the America they want to go back <laughs> yeah. to. Yeah. We're stealing your girlfriend's corpse. I is saw, romantic. I saw a thing today. Some dumbass from my high school posted this it was like a meme and it was like we're setting the clocks back to whatever like daylight savings i'm gonna set my clock back to 1945 when america had some balls i'm like literally what do you think living in 1945 was like because i guarantee you it was not like you think it was no shit like you fucking moron I just like um, I can't. Maybe if you're a rich white man, yeah, anything what, else. What is everyone else no. doing? They're literally out here going insane. Yeah. <laughs> and like, Star- like the list is too long to list right now. But like, you just have no understanding of anything if you think right. that that's an okay thing to post, especially from your 
like he has no perspective. Yeah, is what I'm trying to say. Just point blank. <laughs> No pers- it no was a woman who posted this. I'm like, what the fuck is oh, wrong with yeah, you? Yeah, it is wrong of me to assume, but that's you would think it would, you worse. would think it yeah, would be you a would man. Think it would be some dumb. <laughs> you would think <laughs> it wasn't. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, why don't you set your clocks back and you can play Elena and some fuck yeah. off can be Carl? How about that? How about that? I don't mean that to be a threat. <laughs> By the way, don't sue me. And don't I'm put just me in like. Jail. like so yeah things are things are bad a crowd of young women even came to the jail to see him he has like a posse they gave him flowers they wished him luck in court and they're all rooting for him to win and for him to get elena's body back that's crazy that's his ultimate goal he's like listen guys i just want to make beef stew or beef tea for my lady and resurrect her body like what's the big deal and they're like, <laughs> everything. No, they're like, nothing. Here you go. Sir. Yeah, these people are. <laughs> Thankfully, they actually like went into his house and arrested him instead of just yeah. being like, give us the body, Carl. Oh, my God. Elena's body was kept on display at the funeral home. Thousands, like six, over 6,000 people came to see her body. Rumor has it local schools let out so that they could travel and see the body. Okay, I'm sorry. Like, this is terrible, but I would definitely go see her body. (laughs) It's, I feel like it's not even a body at this point. Yeah. It's like this, I mean, it's 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 like like a mummy. Yeah, it's like a plaster cast of her body, essentially. I would too. I think what, I mean, it's fucked up. Like, they should not be doing this to this woman who has no say in it but it would be (laughs) it would be interesting interesting, yeah and it's cool to like you know i've seen mummies in museums Mm -hmm. and there are good things and bad things about tomb raiding oh um mostly bad mostly (laughs) mostly bad for me the good thing is that i get to see the mummy which is really (laughs) selfish and fucked up and um that i mean that's what it is yeah um but it is mostly bad things. And for what I think is that mummies, like from Egypt, it was so long ago that there's a detachment right, to it. Right, right. This you had been seven years. Yeah, this was, she still had family. There's still people that care about her. Like, this is fucked up. Yeah, it's all fucked up. Yeah. This is one of the only times I'll side with the Catholic Church, but (laughs) Father Galligan warned people not to go see the body publicly. He Mm -hmm. was telling people this, and he stated that if Von Kozel, Carl, were to be judged by the church, he would have much to account for. Yeah, he does. (laughs) Yeah, he should have a lot to account for. The media portrayed Carl in a very nice way light they were always describing him as a man with nine degrees and a scientist and someone who was whose art was skillfully done he had a lot of shit in front of him but he was all in good spirits because elena was with him and she was comforting him so he goes into the hearing and this all happened very quickly like things must have been different in the legal system because he was arrested on october 5th and his hearing started October 8th. So it was just a few days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And it started at 5.30 p.m. so that people could attend his hearing (laughs) after work. (laughs) We should keep doing that. They know what people (laughs) want. Yeah, Yeah. we should keep doing that. (laughs) Nana took the stand and described everything. Carl refuted all of the accusations, and there were a lot of accusations against him of um, molesting the body. I'm sure. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of reports that he inserted, inserted a tube between her legs. Oh, oh, God. I mean, I'm not surprised, but that's horrifying. It's awful. Yeah. And he's so fucking pompous. When he took the stand, he introduced himself saying, my name is Count Carl von Kossel. I am a chemist, engineer, physicist, scientist, ro-engenologist... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> With degrees in philosophy, psychology, and medicine. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) Show us the degrees. (laughs) If you are, I am too. Right. Because <laughs> I too am a scientist and yeah. a medical doctor. If you're a physicist, I'm a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a bird, I'm a bird. <laughs> he told them of the love between him and Elena and how he had been searching for her since his first vision as a young boy. His quest and his actions were described and defended as being divine odyssey. When faced with illegal actions, he defended himself by listing all the things he did for her, such as buying her jewelry and clothes, and said that she was safe with him. Carl pretty accurately answered all the questions they posed to him and described how Elena would talk to him through the years and the process of stealing her body. The judge is like, bro, like, this is over. She's dead. We're going to bury her. And no matter what, Carl's like, give me her body back. That's all I want. Give me my Elena. Freak. Can you imagine watching this guy? He just can't get it through his head. Uh Uh-uh. And Carl's enraged, but the judge is like, fuck you, dude. He orders the body to be buried. And for only her actual relatives to know where the body rests. Carl is ordered back a few days later for a psychiatric evaluation and is held under a $10,000 bail, which is almost $200,000 today. It was completely out of the question for Carl in his mind to plead insanity. He refused because to him it was completely untrue. He was not a nut, he said. He was a great scientist with vision who was just ahead of the times. When someone refuses to plead insanity, that's how you know they are actually They're insane. actually insane. <laughs> yeah. That seems like the best case. Yeah. Like, even if you're not insane, but they're like, do you want to plead insanity? Mm, yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could be insane for you. <laughs> I, could insane I could be insane for the right price. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even Carl's estranged wife, Doris, reached out to the sheriff in a letter noting that Carl was mentally unwell. Doris wanted to testify, but she was never called to stand. We don't know why. Like, that seems like a pretty easy alley-oop. Totally. She was never called to stand. The doctors who examined Carl, despite the judgment of outside experts, deemed him to be sane. He's completely sane. When... For insanity stuff, though, it's like if you're sane enough to stand trial, that's what it is. Like if you plead insanity, I think that just like delays your trial. So he probably was sane enough to sit there. He was sane enough to sit there. Yes. But um, I don't think you'll feel any better about it. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It is important to note that everyone either knew Carl or knew of Carl in the mm-hmm. town. And it's true. He never came off as someone who was mentally unwell. Okay. Of course, if you you know what you know now, he, he was mentally unwell. Right. But he never came off that way. And this case is just completely uncharted territory for everyone involved. The officials in this case didn't know what to do. And with Carl being declared sane and the public split between sympathy and outrage, they just kind of sidestepped it. And you'll see how and sent him off to trial. So Carl was to stand trial that November for removing a corpse and keeping Elena's reconstructed remains for seven years. But they realized that there were no laws they could actually charge him with that had didn't have an expired statute of limitations. Oh shit. But I feel like so he took her out of the grave 7 years ago. Not supposed to do that. Statute yep. of limitations. But then if he still has her in his house like that crime was only like a week ago, like <laughs> having a corpse in your house. So why It's either that it didn't that wasn't applicable yeah, or weird. that they just literally did not want to deal with it. Yeah, I think it's that. half and half because it seems like they just really wanted to be done with this because yeah. they didn't know 
what to do. Yeah, I mean, what kind of precedent do you have to look back on for that? None. Yeah, literally none. none. Yeah. And at the time, the statutory limitation for molesting a grave was two years. Yeah. So I don't know if there are, you like, I don't know what the laws were for having remains right because probably no one did like those yeah. laws were all for like grave robbing <laughs> yeah so it's like well we, shit we never thought this far yeah, no one wants to rob a body well actually there were people robbing like bodies from graves a lot like getting their skeletons for medical research yeah. but that's exactly what it is so you yeah. stole it you stole it and, and now that expired after two years yeah it's been seven yeah (laughs) he stole a body and so the judge it seems just wanted to let it go there was more than enough evidence but judge lord his name was thought justice would be served well enough if elena's family just got her body back and they could bury her in a secret grave he should at least have to pay the family money right like i feel like they should have at least taken him. Tell me they took him to like civil court for like psychological settlement. Nope. No? Nope. God, None of that. Have. None of that. Um, he even petitioned and ended up winning this because he gave her so much clothing and jewelry and these gifts. And he petitioned the family. He's like, those are mine. I bought them. And when it's a gift that belongs to the deceased person yeah. and when they die it goes to the next of kin mm-hmm. um but he fought it so hard that they had to give him everything that he had gifted her back Ugh, that's so, such bullshit he's a piece of shit yeah luckily elena's body was eventually put to rest after all of this The chief of police, the undertaker, and the cemetery sexter were in charge of preparing and burying Elena one last time. And it had to be in secret. In order to keep it hush-hush, they dismembered her body and put it in an 18-inch square coffin so they could discreetly bury it. What? Right? Why? Like, insult to injury. Why can't you just put it in a normal coffin and bury it normally? Well, they probably knew he'd go looking around for a big, like, six-foot-wide hole. But right? drive it out of town. Are right. There not- it's going to be secret. He had, Like, the, uh, the family members are sworn into secrecy. There are plenty of people who die every day, and they're going to be, like, just... Pretend like dig a new like another plot a decoy yeah a decoy <laughs> <laughs> to this day we don't know where she rests wow. some speculate she's in the old cemetery where she was before um some people think that she's under a brick fireplace in an old key west home no one really knows only those three people and her immediate family members were told but all of her family members ended up dying of tuberculosis too so it just died with them? It just them? stopped. Wow. Yes. That's why. I know. I kind of hope she's buried under a fireplace because that is just yeah, creepy. Yeah, that is creepy, but I doubt it. I doubt it, too. I think she's probably just buried in the same yeah. spot, maybe even in the mausoleum. <laughs> You're like, ah. We'll just like, change the locks. What are the odds? <laughs> he thinks that we thought that it was smart enough to put it in here. Right. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Carl was released from prison in poor spirits, but somehow he still had fans. Even after losing his job um, and being accused of necrophilia and grave robbing, fans showed up from him for him from all over the nation. They greeted him outside the prison house to shake his hand, bring him flowers, take pictures, and they all wanted to see the airplane hangar. Carl charged people for tours of his property in order to make money. Eventually, he ended up leaving Key West and moved back to um, Zephyr Hills, and he helped his sister, who was in poor health. Just hours after Carl and his moving vans left Key West, a blast destroyed the mausoleum he had built for Elena. Did he bomb it? Yep. 
Oh, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> Carl rigged dynamite in her mausoleum as a final goodbye. And then he wrote and published his memoirs. And he used a mold of Elena's head that he had made while she was in his, um, while he had her body. Um, and he made a new model of her body which he lived with for the rest of his life. It's just weird plaster body pillow of a real person. It's been reported that he died with the model in his arms, but some say that that was the real body and that Carl found a way to have the body switched. Wow. That is the spooky, chilling fucked up tale of Carl Tanzler and poor Elena. That was upsetting. I was hoping for nothing more and nothing <laughs> less than upsetting. Um, the remainder of the pictures are people at their trial, um, people at his trial, a What's ton of people that? showed up. That's the glass eyeballs that were, that oh, he put in no. her. Good. Yeah. We'll God. post these all to Instagram. It's really messed up. I don't even know if Instagram will allow it. Yeah, probably not. Um, it's we'll really scary. We'll post her picture while she is alive. It's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. it's on YouTube. YouTube allows <laughs> it. <laughs> um, my sources are wilsonfuneraladvice.com, Atlas Obscura, Undying Love, The True Story of a Passion That Defied Death by Ben Harrison, Wikipedia, and museumfacts.co. UK. Happy Halloween, bitches. Jesus Christ. Happy Halloween, bitches. Thank you all so much for listening to this upsetting story. Thank you, Haley, for telling it. I really enjoyed it. Good. <laughs> and if you really enjoyed it, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Tell a friend. Follow us on social media. And maybe even consider joining our Patreon. Don't forget about the costume party on Friday, October 29th at 8 p.m. Central Time. We will see you there. Love you guys. Thank you so much and three two one class dismissed